Okay, hope you're all awake after lunch, not going into a food coma, because I'm going to have to speed through quite a lot here. This is a quite technical presentation, I'm going to squeeze into half an hour. I'm going to start with some the bad news first on some difficulties we may face on transitioning into a renewable energy economy, and finish on more positive notes of uh, things that we can do to adapt our communities and help speed along this transition. And if you're the kind of person who might want to take pictures of something in case you forget it, don't worry, I'm going to have a link right at the end to all my notes. You'll be able to check in detail the things I've been talking about. So I may be skimming over a few points. A lot of what this presentation is based on is uh, a couple of free books you can find and read for free online. The first one, uh, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air by the late Dr. Uh, David Mackay from Cambridge University looked at the UK's economy as sort of a case study of whether we can meet all of our uh, needs of energy with just the renewable potentials that we have for this island. And while it's not as applicable to the whole globe, it's very useful for looking at how useful some of these technologies are. And the second book, Our Renewable Future, from just a couple of years ago by a couple of guys from the Post Carbon Institute, takes a more global look at our economy and some big barriers in how fast we can implement uh, putting renewables in place. So I want to give you a, a quick look at sort of the state of our current economy. And if you've ever seen now, some of the artwork that's come out of the Zeitgeist movement, you may well have seen this picture. It gives sort of a feeling for our industrial excess, the way we spoil the planet, but you know, it's not a real thing. I'd like to give you more a realistic look at what's actually going on out there, because we don't have this gigantic, monstrous machine towering over us every day. So I found this picture of a gigantic, monstrous machine towering over us, and I'd like to ask you, in this age of easy photo manipulation, Put your hand up if you think this is fakery, some Photoshop or it's a few there, or say CGI for a movie, something like that. We've got maybe 10 to 20 percent. Um, I'm going to give you some bad news. It's real, and this is the largest land vehicle that man has ever created. It's one of a few called bucket excavator machines. They're used for strip mining away coal to, uh, soil sorry, to get at coal beds under the earth. They're fed by grid electricity. But then, of course, if you're using energy to get down at something under the ground, to get energy out then, to burn, to turn into energy, they must be getting more out than they're getting in, a concept that I'll come back to in a minute. When you see scenes of devastation like that, and I'm sure we've all seen the uh, oil sands in Canada, and you compare it to the kind of impact you get with putting renewable systems in place. It makes it kind of hard to sympathize with groups like these guys who unfortunately have to live around and deal with, interact with. But they have seized on one true little point embedded within this big picture is that electricity costs and fuel poverty are rising, but it's not because of wind turbines going in place, which are actually one of the cheapest ways historically to supply renewable energy and of any energy. And I'll come back to why it's going up in a few minutes. And more on the scale, the way you ship things around <laughs> the world is a bit crazy at the moment. It's just a shipping, ship, shipping, shipping ships. <laughs> but this is also a real picture of one of our biggest movers at sea, able to take oil rigs out to sea where they're needed, or you could bring uh, marine wind turbines out with this sort of thing, but all our cargo ships, smaller than this and this one, almost all of them depend on oil as a fuel. As with our trucks and our airplanes, to bring everything to us from food, to medicine, any goods that we get. If we are running out of oil, that could be a big problem for us. And if you look at uh, the way, say, Cuba and North Korea were impacted when the Soviet Union collapsed and they had their oil imports cut, you can see the kind of chaos that can create. So how much energy are we actually using in all this scale? You can see here a few different uh, transitions have already occurred in our energy economy when before we used to rely a lot on wood, before we discovered coal, 
and then mixed in oil and gas in the mixture there. And it's, you can see, grown enormously in the last 150 years, but you may wonder, well, our population has increased a lot as well in that time, so has it gone up per person? And you may be surprised, when you look at the uh, per person energy usage, there's also been an explosion in how much we use. For in the last uh, 50 years, as you're probably well aware, the post-war periods when consumerism and advertising really took off, there's an off-quoted statistic, for instance, in Story of Stuff, that the US's consumption of resources roughly doubled in that time, and yet their happiness just decreased, didn't go anywhere up along with the resource use. Um, so also, you might not be able to see clearly what's going on with oil in there, sandwiched in between other resources, so you gotta wonder, has peak oil happened or is it happening or going to happen? Well, in most of the oil producing countries in the world, it's already a matter of history. Peak oil has happened in most places. This doesn't include the biggest ones, such as Saudi Arabia, who have still continued managing to increase their consumption. But there has been a bit of skepticism around whether it's gonna be a problem anytime soon, coming from one particular country recently, which was the USA, since they developed hydraulic fracturing, which allowed their uh, oil production, which had peaked and was going down, and all their conventional wells are continuing to follow that curve. They've had a sudden boom in fracking, but if you check out a, a recent TEDx lecture at Fintorn by uh, a retired geologist by the name of Dr. David Smythe, he was, uh, showing that the fracking industry in the US hasn't actually managed to turn a profit on what they've sold. You know, they could barely compete in the market and have run up debts. The uh, costs plus debt amounting to about twice what they've sold their oil for, so there could be a big bubble crash in that market pending quite soon. And with those small oil wells peaking really quickly, that may that little bit may peak very soon, and it might not be a technology that can be imported to Britain, no matter how much the Conservative Party want it. So, what is a peak in any given resource? Well, when our ancestors were roaming the planet, they may well have found what is called native gold, silver, and copper, ores that were readily available, didn't, no, sorry, metals that didn't need to be taken out of ores, and there were high quality resources to be found in some places, but they would have been whipped up quite quickly by any organized community. And as civilization developed, you know, all the easy to get resources of any kind were used first, obviously. And then we're down to things that you have to move a lot of rock just to get at what you want to extract. And so what a peak is, is when the increasing difficulty of accessing resource under the ground is increasing faster than your technology to make it easier to extract and keep up with it. So you, can, you can't increase your rate of production anymore. And the, the more you push trying to extract it faster, the sharper the downfall is going to be at the end. And there's been a, another good book about this recently, uh, guestie by Christopher Clarkston looking sort of as a, a case study of what our resource scarcity looks like around the world. That there are, are many uh, resources under the ground in close to critical scarcity or imagine for instance if we suffered a shortage of what we needed to create uh, concrete for the basis of wind turbines or say any of the rare elements needed in uh, solar photovoltaic panels, we could be in quite dire straits. There's a bit of this also addressed in the Zeitgeist Movement to find a few pages there, a bit more briefly that you can read. And the usual challenges that are raised to having a renewable energy economy, as I've already mentioned, were about where you can put things and people having resistance to something in their backyard. Uh, also, the amount of consumption that we already have and the way the economic system wants to keep growing demand where we might be in a declining energy scenario, 
of course, well-known the intermittency, as in uh, how unreliable wind power is. And the one I want to talk about most of all is the least talked about, is how much energy actually goes into constructing new systems. So if we ask, can we live on our renewables? This was the sort of climax of the book, um, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air, stacking up our current consumption and say, the renewable potentials that we have for the UK. And it looks a bit grim that if we tried to live on our renewables here today with our huge consumption, some of this is not often included, is the energy that goes into the stuff that we make or that people are making for us and gets shipped over to us. And uh, so we would end up being net importers of energy in that kind of scenario. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the globe would be that way, but it's more an indictment of our over-consuming, overpopulated little haven that we have here for the rich. And it shows that, for instance, in our transportation system, our heating, and our ridiculous overconsumption, there are great savings to be made that could make a renewable future far more possible. The big problem we have is whenever you make something, whether the chairs you're sitting on, this very building, floorboards under our feet, whether you're casting some steel, forming it, ripping up wood into planks, everything has energy put into it in creating material and in forming it in the factory. And it's just some examples from uh, a big database from Bath University looking at how much energy typically goes into what we make things out of. You can see just from a couple of examples here that when we recycle, for instance, aluminium compared to creating out of the ore, we make about a tenfold saving in how much energy goes into doing that. And then right at the bottom, our timber industry, there was, most of these have included the average values, but there was a huge range that they found in the embodied energy of wood delivered to a factory. And that factor of 20, they found, was because of the distance delivering it. When you get wood straight next to some forestry going on, it's one of the best, most easily sustainable materials that we can use. But transport adds a huge energy cost onto it, which can be a problem on how remotely we want to make something. And all of this feeds into a concept called the energy return on energy invested. So whether you're drilling a well which is very messy business to say get geothermal power or oil out of the ground or whether you're making solar panels out of silica and some rare elements you're going to put a lot of energy investment into getting it going now the way it's been historically with uh, with oil, there's, they would get a lot of energy right at the start and it would, it would gradually increase. But the situation we have with uh, renewables tends to be we put a lot more energy in right at the start and then it's very constant there onwards. The, the system lasts for much longer. However, there was, uh, because we've been trying to grow our use of renewables, there's quite a worrying study from Stanford University in 2013. They looked at all the photovoltaic panels that have been installed in the world so far and looking at whether they were create, putting energy into the economy. And they found that up till 2010, all of our solar installed capacity had been a net sink of energy because the older panels, so inefficient, have such a long payback time, and because we were trying to make them as quickly as we could, they weren't putting energy in. It was more of an investment in the future. That doesn't mean that they don't pay off eventually. They do have a return on energy, but it's a problem if we need to grow the use of something like that very quickly, there will be a limit to how fast we can build, say, PV panels. Otherwise, we need to find other places to save energy in order to make them. And the next bit, intermittency, is pretty self-explanatory. I won't have to go over that. It's just, you know, the day and night cycle, that sort of thing. This is what it looks like when it actually hits the grid. This is the solar and wind input to the German power grid in 2013. 
and you can see the very obvious thing that in the middle of summer you get plenty of solar panel, uh, power. It's a great thing if you're somewhere warm and you want cooling. It's not so useful if you're in a cold temperate place like here and you need heating in winter. And it almost looks like the wind power makes up for that since you get a fair bit more during winter. But uh, when you go down to the weekly and daily, you can see there can be problems when there are lulls of a couple of weeks. Say if you have no wind for a while. And in that case, we really need some storage to have energy, you know, to be heating during winter. And while there are some great solutions to this, many being developed, our cheapest so far being pumping water up and down hill. Uh, we've possibly reached about half of our capacity that we can install on in the globe of pumped hydro. It depends who you ask on which areas are feasible. But uh, there are other ways that we can also uh, adapt to a fluctuating energy supply. Say if we have uh, grid connected and timed appliances, say in heating, not so much of the ridiculous internet of things of connecting your toaster to the internet to know when it's done or something, but more very practical of saving yourself money on big things like heating. And if we can get that connected to some types of industry where if they can slow down or speed up production uh, when the wind is blowing or not, there are only so many industries that can do that, but if tariffs can be available for them to save money, that's what we need to incentivize that kind of thing going on. And you may hear sometimes that a particular country is getting almost all of its, uh, say, electricity in the form of renewable power. And you wonder, are they always already there? Are they completely self-sufficient? But there's a bit of bad news on that also. That globally, we only get about 19 20% globally of our energy in the form of electricity. This is the US where they get about 21%. In poorer countries it would be less because they would have uh, less electric grid rolled out. So not only do we need to replace all of our electricity supply with uh, renewable sources, but we need to have five times as much of our electricity supply in the form of some kind of renewable energy in order to supply all our current needs. Otherwise, we need to find a way to decrease our consumption of energy to make that easier. And just, I go a few very quick examples, a few tastes of some examples from <coughs> those books of problems we'll run into. For instance, in creating uh, metals, as you saw earlier, you need very high temperatures to be smelting metals or, say, creating concrete. And, uh, we can get some of our energy for systems like these safe from solar collectors, but these can only be put in some places in the world. There are very few of them, and there are some systems that won't allow fluctuating supply. And so we can do things, say, with charcoal or biogas, but that would then compete with our needs to balance the grid itself with those kinds of storage. So we need to find more ways of getting energy storage in that way. Say, as Adam Drage was saying earlier, if we can reduce our meat consumption, we could have more land to produce, you know, have forestry going on and get charcoal from that as a sustainable fuel to use in high temperature applications and balance our grid out at the same time. Here's a look at Transport, this is a graph of how much energy you can fit per weight and size into something. The things on the left hand side are things that would be too heavy to fit in a uh, fly a plane with, at least one that was carrying many passengers or cargo. And the things down the bottom would take up far too much space in a truck and or would need you to have a much bigger vehicle. So looking at a situation where we need a lot of investments in infrastructure that can, you know, for instance, trains be more easily linked into our grid and be a bit more efficient. But there's still something 
missing here way off the graph, but I like this picture to give a better idea of the difference here. You see, you may wonder why I bring this up in transport, that uranium used in a nuclear reactor has, say, a million to one difference in how much energy it delivers compared to uh, petrol in a car. Well, there are already uses of uh, nuclear power out there in transport. When you think of it at sea, you might think of, say, uh, nuclear submarines, and even then, the missile systems and not the reactors running them, but there are already some ships out there running on nuclear power. These are, for instance, on the bottom left, icebreakers running around the Arctic, allowing some of those cargo ships to get through during the winter. But we've got into such a situation uh, with the ice thinning on the polar ice caps recently that just this last winter was the first time a ship was able to make a delivery through Arctic ice without an icebreaker in front of it, just a regular ship, much stronger than Titanic. But Fortunately, there are renewable systems that we can put in place for our shipping. Not quite the tall ships of the traditional age of sail, but uh, these systems, for instance, rotor ships and kite ships, they are much more easy to automate, but the trouble is these proofs of concept have only been used as fuel saving with otherwise a conventional diesel oil motor. And if we want to have still things shipped around the globe, then we'll need to accept that things may take longer to get there until we have some other, you know, greater renewable sources and ways of keeping things going for a long distance at sea. Otherwise, if consumption is going to keep increasing, you may well see an increase in those nuclear power ships going about as oil is running out. And last of all, one of the most important problems already raised is uh, a trouble with agriculture that the way we're using our lands now, having a lot of flat plains and uh, you know pollution and land running off, destroying the soil by having it just wash away into rivers. We need to be using different methods, whether permacultural methods on the land or localizing our production in, say, uh, hydroponic greenhouses locally, but that will take a lot of energy input, a lot of investment just to set up greenhouses, all the glass and infrastructure involved. And you can see that in our current, well, this is the US food system. They have about seven calories of fossil fuel energy going into each calorie of foods, although a calorie is not necessarily a great measure of the nutrition of a food. Still, there has been some improvement there in the where we're saving some by refrigeration and in some ways some of our food production has become more efficient but still we know that we're wasting a lot that's not going to poor regions because of the way our economy is structured so you've got to wonder at the end of the day how much are we wasting i'm sure you've heard plenty of statistics from charities going on about this every day I just mentioned a couple, for examples, that say of all the plastic we go th through and throw away worldwide, still only 9% of our plastic waste is being recycled worldwide after creating 8.3 billion tons of it, 6.3 billion has ended up as waste. Only 16% of our electrical waste is being recycled after such a great legal push to you know, force collectors and the people creating it to support the recycling of electronics. And clearly we have quite a hoarding culture going on. And we have 1.2 billion cars or road vehicles on our roads in the world. I was thinking of putting up a, a parking lot to illustrate that on how much we waste, but it's a bit disingenuous because you know at the end of the day, they are used at some point two times a day to go to work and get back again. So although there's been, it's been found that one car put into a car share scheme, not Uber, but actual car sharing, tends to liberate about 15 cars from the roads. That doesn't really help commuters. What we really need there is a bigger, more integrated public transport system that will get people to and fro and not have so much focus on roads, which we may not be able to use anymore 
with even just the requirement of oil going into rubber for the tires. And I was going to have a quick intermission, but unfortunately, you won't have time for it. I'm going to move on to part two, which is named after a little article that we'll get to in a second. We've got a situation at the moment where our resource consumption, you've probably heard, is in overshoot. Last year, Earth Overshoot Day, the day when we'd used up all the resources that Earth can renew, was 2nd of August. It gets closer every day, and our debt-based money system keeps forcing people within this economy to try and grow, and economists, economists want to hear nothing of uh, the growing. And of course, there are two aspects of the problem here, the uh, population growth and how much we use per person best way to slow population growth if you haven't heard about the uh, the demographic transition theory is reducing our death rate by defeating disease and this has happened a lot faster in countries recently than it originally happened when we defeated disease here when we first industrialized so there's a bit of good news there but we need to get down to a stage where our resource consumption is not growing and we, we need to find a steady state economy somewhere below our current level. Uh, one of the best ways that we can uh, lower our consumption would be on the demand side. So our best system would be say a, a tool or toy library so you can save money and resources and if we all pile into getting only the few best pieces of equipment instead of following the pattern of everybody having one each and it all being junk that no tradesman would ever use because they know it will break. We'll be able to have much lower consumption and here's where the name for this second part comes from. This was from sort of the white paper that started the RepRap or Replicating Rapid Prototype Project by Dr. Adrian Boyer from Bath University looking at uh, self-replicating robots as a, a way of producing where before uh, John von Neumann's concept of a universal constructor wherever it was attempted to Im be implemented looked at something that's assembled itself whereas instead this project looked at something that would produce useful products but people would have to assemble it and this project managed to bring the cost of 3D printers from tens of thousands of pounds down to hundreds of pounds. And uh, Adrian's concept in this was suggesting that it would be a way of reaching the aims of, say, you know, the better aims of socialism, of giving regular people access to advanced means of production, but without the uh, blood and violence that's come with, you know, big revolution of trying to take means of production away from people and made it so that it would be a self-evolving concept. I've tried to fit this in, this is meant to be a sort of family tree of how these evolved with open source developments that people took the designs online and made little variations. Now you can't keep track of just how many different varieties of rep wraps there are out there, but I want to pose to you that we now have uh, replicators out there in the world in both senses of the the Star Trek kind that makes something useful and the Stargate kind where it makes itself and that's in the form of the way we had programmable computers back in the 40s that it was the size of a room and it had human components to it and that would be the hackerspaces project worldwide ways of having people come along and share great tools to work on projects together and they can replicate themselves. And if we can build more of these locally, we can have a local economy to have uh, you know, build things with lower consumption of resources. And there are a set of tools, for instance, that can help you to create these. It was said by David Gingery writing a set of books about making, making your own uh, metal working shop back in the 80s that the only thing you needed to make any other shop and any other tool in the workshop was a lathe. That was quite the case and that was talking about making just a little uh, charcoal fired 
aluminium recycling furnace, that's what the book was about, to make the parts, to make a lathe, and you can do that a lot more easily now with a 3D printer. And since we have the open source ecology project with putting up design files for all the kinds of tools you would need for a basic civilization online, it makes it a lot easier. Also made out of metal, and we have this situation in our old uh, recycling industry that we tend to recycle the most valuable bits, say, of electrical parts first. It used to get chucked in other people's shores, but now it tends to go to volunteers around here. We're forced legally to recycle things here, so we have a big problem of excess plastic on our hand. It just so happens that we can use that in 3D printers if we can get to process it. It's an idea I had back just out of university looking at how we could structure an RV. I thought back then if business as usual continued, we would end up doing something called landfill mining, getting valuable resources out of there, and that we should set ourselves up, say, as a recycling center to start a microcosm of an RVD, that you would have people bring resources to you that you could then create things out of. I was delighted to find that there are already some charities doing that kind of thing. It's, uh, it's just a yard out of a charity that's that's the plastic they collected after taking apart a load of electronics and shipping off the valuable bits because it was too expensive to uh, you know, to have it picked up until they had a giant truckload of it. But thanks to the Precious Plastic Project, similar to Open Source Ecology, there are now quite cheap tools that you can get to recycle plastic locally and create things with them. Here's an even more raggedy looking setup where they've managed to get going with second hand equipment. I don't know if you can guess where that is by all the pock marks in the ceiling. That's actually a warehouse in the Gaza Strip where, in the hardest of conditions, they have already set up a lab around the corner from there to be creating things locally. And we can also create the 3D printers themselves out of some of the electronic waste that we collect from, say, as you all know old 2D printers that are poorly made and even print some parts with the very mud under our feet to make some types of cheap components. And is a great case study of a little uh, charity that takes old things and you know fixes them up a little bit if they can or mostly just takes the best and sells it on to the public at low cost and of course you know charity shops do that all across the country already but they're doing that to feed onto another charity, um, you know, to some other purpose. And lately some of them have even started selling, you know, mass-produced tap from China to just slightly increase their profits. Whereas this place, their core purpose is the prevention of waste. And what's special is they're one of only a handful within the whole country that are based on a council recycling point, have a relationship with the council to their there just to prevent waste and I think we need one of these in every town in the country and if you are worried at all that that's not something very sustainable looking at their figures they their sales grew by over 250 percent in the last five years and they're just going from strength to strength with more projects now ongoing using the old materials and you can find uh, many projects like these n near you in your town on shareable.net with the Sharing Cities Network. And if there isn't one of these for your town, make one. And here's just a quick one that I like the idea of in London. You might want to check it out. And if you need support to create these kinds of initiatives, you need to find your local transition town, or if you don't have one, Again, create one. There's plenty of great media out there to find more about it. I highly recommend Joe Duggan's talk from 2016 with his idea of duocracy that if you want these things done, you can't just be talking about shoulds. You need to get out there and put your effort into making these projects happen. And where there are no grants, you can create your own grant funding body. Here's just an example of a, a West Scotland community that identified they had an unused uh, dam on a weed burn around the corner they went to the local community in a share scheme that only local people could invest in and they quickly managed to get uh, a turbine going in a hut nearby and 
I've been told by one of the organizers of this project that they paid their costs off after a couple of years and they're now selling something like 100k worth of electricity every year and some of that can go into grant funds for local projects. So just to summarize, one of the phrases used by Dr. Mackay in his book, it's, you can't live with a mantra, every little helps, it needs to be every big helps. We need to do things that make big differences, so you can't just go around switching things off. We've got to change our lifestyles and uh, change, you know, help people around us to adapt to a way of lower consumption in a way such as tool libraries, so that we're not constantly going out buying things we don't need. And I just have to cut it off there and maybe take a quick question later, but I think Adam wants to get on. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>